is day seven of Christmas Tide because this year I am celebrating 12 days of Christmas. You can find the other videos in the series linked in the description down below. And yes, I am wearing my pyjamas because it's one of those kinds of days. Someone mentioned in the comments of yesterday's video, how do you balance back so quickly? I don't. I'm just capable of putting all of my energy into 30 minutes of filming. And then that's it. If you're not already subscribed, then click or tap the button below and make sure you turn on notifications so you don't miss anything. Today we're going to have a little chat about ways you can be a good friend to a disabled person like me. The start of the year is a time of great reflection and change. Metaphorically, obviously, much like your birthday, you don't actually feel very different from one day to the next. I personally mark the start of the year by considering where I was 10 years ago. It tends to put into perspective just how far I've come, considering I spent much of my teenage years entirely bedbound. It also makes me prouder of where I am now. I mean, obviously there are things that I miss from 10 years ago, my grandparents for instance, but generally life really does seem to be getting better year on year, even if my body isn't. I mean it isn't all silver linings though, obviously. One of the things I tend to ponder on deeply at the turn of the year is friendships, those lost and those gained. This particularly comes from the yearly exchange of Christmas cards. Have I even spoken to this person since the last time I sent them a festive card? Have they moved country and were so out of touch I didn't even know? Do I still want this person in my life? And with my birthday being at the end of January, I draw up my party invite list at the start of the year, so I tend to really think about who just isn't part of my life anymore. On the flip side, there are wonderful new people who have entered my life and become firm friends. I moved schools a lot when I was younger and then I became really ill when I was in sick form, so I had to take loads of time off school and by the time I came back everyone else had moved on, new friendship groups. To be fair, I wouldn't say I've ever struggled to make friends. I'm a yellow personality after all. Watch our colour code personality video to know what on earth I am talking about there. But I feel sometimes that they weren't very deep friendships. I had a lot of people I was very friendly with, but just a few I actually cared about. And they didn't tend to know each other, so I didn't get to do like the group friend thing much. And I always wanted a friend star group. I mean, probably most people want a close friend group. That's not exactly revolutionary, Jessica, thanks. People ask me a lot about my experiences of dating with a disability, but I've actually found making friends whilst having a disability to be way harder. People have to be immensely forgiving. I will cancel on you with very short notice. I have to be late sometimes because I literally could not get up off the floor 20 minutes before the party started, and I will definitely forget simple things in an incredibly annoying way. Hmm. Which is not to say that any of the friendships I have lost over the years are directly caused by my disabilities or that I'm trying to put blame on someone or anything like that. It's just that people grow and change and unlike a marriage where you're always working as a team and the idea is to grow together, it's incredibly easy to put a friendship down and to forget about it, to not put the hard work in. Much like dating though, meeting new people in the hope of starting a friendship is very hard when you have a disability or health condition. We don't tend to leave our houses much. Traditional group outing places aren't particularly accessible. Some people carry a great deal of ableist prejudice or are well-meaning but incredibly embarrassing or embarrassed about talking to someone who they know has a disability. According to research from the Disability Charity Scope, 85% of young adults with a disability feel lonely. And as a result, over half of working age disabled people who have felt lonely in the past year said they experienced depression. That's 62% of them felt that they experienced depression. Them. Us. 62% of us experienced depression. 58% experienced anxiety and just under half experienced stress. That isolation. Uh, see, within my week, I tend to see Claudia, my wife, obviously, we live together, Clara, my best friend and carer on weekdays, my favourite sign language interpreter, Ruth Ann, my dogs, Walter and Tilly, most weeks I also see my sister-in-law, her husband and their baby. I mean, that's not really a lot of people. But now I also do finally have a group of friends who live near me. Hi, Lou. And we talk often, pretty much daily, in a little group chat where we also send each other hilarious memes or embarrassing pictures. And we get together for no reason and they're all super sweet and cater to my needs without making a thing of it. Hallelujah. And maybe that's an age thing. Maybe they're all just excellent human beings. Maybe my taste in human beings has improved. Which brings us to 
10 ways to be a better friend to a disabled person. Now I realise if you're watching this, you're probably one of the awesome people who already knows a lot about how to be a good human. But if you would like to educate yourself further, or you're a disabled person who wants to help educate others, although, disclaimer, having a disability doesn't mean that you know everything about all disabilities, they're incredibly varied and we all have very different experiences, basically you just have to ask, it's all on an individual basis, but I wanted to make a list video anyway. Please also share this video with your friends and add your own suggestions in the comments. A good support network is one of the most important factors in managing a disability. Here are my top tips given whilst I make shoe pastry swans because today Claude and I are exchanging seven swans of swimming presents and I couldn't think of anything else. Number 10. Acknowledge the person's disability. Now this namby pam being around, ugh. Honestly, nothing makes me feel more valid and noticed than when an able-bodied person says, wow, I've got a virus today and I feel really, really bad, but this must be what it's like for you all the time. Respect. Respect to you too, my friend. <laughs> okay, none of my friends actually talk like that, unless they're pretending to be Aretha Franklin. Nine. But also, don't make everything about their disability. Oh, so you can't go to that crazily inaccessible mini golf place because your friend who uses a wheelchair is using their wheelchair today, so now you all have to rearrange and you have to go to the bowling ring instead? Why would you need to tell the person? You don't. I'm sure your friend is plenty aware of what they can and cannot do and where they can and cannot go and how annoying that is for them. Following on from that, if someone has told you that something has a medical reason behind it, don't question it. Wow, you drink a lot of Diet Coke. Yes, I do. It's so I don't faint constantly and so I don't feel nauseous. Actually, funnily enough, my doctor told me that I should have it. <sighs> don't you worry about all those chemicals in your body though? Ah, uh, well, A, you should see the other chemicals my doctor prescribes me with. B, better than fainting and vomiting all the time. C, you have no right to make me feel guilty about my body. And D, is that a glass of vodka in your hand? Don't pretend to have an expert opinion on a person's body when you are neither their doctor nor have their lived experience. Number seven, be flexible, particularly if your friend has a condition that fluctuates and affects their health and their body but in a rather up and down manner. Because yes, they could do that with you yesterday, but no, they can't do that with you today. However, they are still the same awesome person. So just be flexible where they can't be. Six, small gestures can go a really long way. Whether that's picking up some shopping on the way over, offering to tidy their room a little bit while you chat, taking them to the cinema and handling everything. What could seem like a small thing to you can be a really big thing to that person. Just ask them what they might need a little help with. But small acts of kindness always show that you care. Avoid the kind of generic terms and phrases like, oh, we all have sad days, to your chronically depressed friend, or oh, I get really tired this time of year too, to your friend with chronic fatigue. You don't look bad, to your friend who is two steps away from dying. We all have to go sometime, to your friend who is terminal. Okay, well, wait, to be, to be fair, if you're that much of an asshole, I don't really think they're your friends. We all tend to use these phrases as a way to be nice to people and connect, and that's good, but also just make sure you're not minimizing their situation. Number four, avoid talk of cures or alternative therapies. Just because it worked for your Aunt Janice, who has a completely different condition to mine, does not mean that I really want to hear about it. Don't suggest solutions until you're actually presented with the problem. And if you dare come at me with either yoga or kale, you are off the Christmas card list. Number three, if you don't know what to say, just say that. I'd much rather hear, oh, uh, hmm, don't know what the right thing to say is, but I, I really feel for you right now and I love you, rather than an incredibly awkward silence. Two, research your disabled friend's condition. 
Sales Creepy isn't. They probably spend a lot of time educating people on exactly what it is they have and how it affects them. Obviously, you won't know everything about a person from just their diagnosis and a quick Google, but at least you'll have a base knowledge that you can then build upon by just, just you know, asking them things, but not too many things. Listen to the person, they're the expert. Don't question their diagnosis or medical treatments or even how they're feeling, unless you actually have some knowledge in this area and maybe not even that. And by the way, I mean a doctorate, not an ability to Google. Listen when they just want to vent and get angry. Everybody needs to be a little bit self-pitying sometimes. And if they immediately afterwards want to snap back to, everything is fine and good, you just go with that. It's important to ask how you can help, or if they even really need your help, or if they want your help before just jumping in. Especially don't move anyone's wheelchair without asking. That's, that's irritating. That's really irritating. And don't take a blind person to a different spot because you think that's where they're aiming to go. Might not be. And also personal space. To sum up this whole point though, just listen. Really listen to the person's answer. There you go, 10 top tips and a shoe pastry swan. What could be better? Please leave your tips in the comments down below. I'm very interested to know what do you think. And also subscribe if you're not already and please share this video with your friends.